My name is Raghav Ringshare, and I'm one of the Florida House interns this summer. We also have two other interns joining us today, Sarah Garavaglia and Emma Bernstein. And we are pleased to welcome you to the second seminar of Made an Inventor series. Here at Florida House, the only state embassy in DC, we work to connect, celebrate, and champion Florida to the world. We operate as a nonprofit organization providing educational, cultural, economic, and social resources to connect Floridians with Washington, DC. In doing so, we're proud to host the Made and Inventor series in partnership with the Cade Museum of Creativity and Invention, as well as the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame to bring Florida inventors into the spotlight. Today, we have a very special guest speaker, Phoebe Miles, who is broadcasting here at Florida House. Phoebe Miles is the co-founder of the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention in Gainesville, Florida. Her father, Job, uh, James Robert Cade, was the founder of Caterade, giving her an unprecedented look at uh, patents, inv inventions, and creativity. A native of Gainesville, Ms. Miles' graduation fee beta kappa and received a BA in German, a bachelor's in history, and a teacher's certificate from the University of Washington in 1987. She is fluent in German and working on Spanish, Mandarin, and French. From 1988 to 2006, she and her husband spent a decade living and working overseas in Germany, Barbados, and Argentina. They have lived intermittently in Washington, D.C. since 1992 and have three adult children and one granddaughter. We have the pleasure of hosting the Cade Museums in a state of innovation, an exhibition about our state's incredible and widespread contribution to innovation. The exhibit even highlights some of the speakers you will hear from in this series of talks. This exhibition and the series itself would not have been possible without guidance from Stephanie Bales, President and Executive Director of the Cade Museum, for creativity and invention. I'd like to welcome Stephanie uh, to say a few words. Um, Stephanie is uh, having some problems, so we will move on to uh, introduce Jamie uh, Spurrier, the program manager from the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you all, first of all. I want to thank um, Florida House and the Cade Museum for Creativity and Innovation for this wonderful opportunity. What a, privilege, what, a privilege it, what a privilege it is to be here to hear Phoebe's incredible story today. And what a perfect collaboration and celebration of innovation in the state of Florida. And that's really at the heart of the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame to celebrate the spirit of innovation in Florida and to serve as a hub for the innovation ecosystem. So the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame was founded in 2013 by um, Dr. Paul Sandberg, who was last week's um, featured speaker, along with then University of South Florida President Judy Genshaft with the intention of recognizing and celebrating Florida's vibrant innovation ecosystem and the remarkable inventors from our state, all of whom have advanced the quality of life for all Americans. It is our mission to encourage individuals of all ages and backgrounds to strive toward innovation and the betterment of society through continuous groundbreaking innovation. We are driven to support a culture of creativity, one that fuels innovation, drives economic growth, and encourages investment in Florida. We are a statewide initiative located at the, Re at the Research Park at the University of South Florida where our museum exhibits inventions and innovations from our inventors. To date, we have inducted 58 remarkable inventors who collectively hold over 4,000 patents. And each year we hold an annual ceremony in Tampa where we celebrate and recognize that year's inductees. We would love for you to come and visit us anytime or join us at the ceremony in Tampa on November 5th. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we now have Stephanie Bales, President and Executive Director of the Cade Museum. I'd like to welcome her to say a few words about the project. Hi, thank you so much for um, having us there here today. Um, my name is Stephanie Bales, and I am here at the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention. We're located in Gainesville, Florida. Our mission is to transform communities through inspiring and equipping future inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries. And we have a vision of spreading an inventor's mindset around the world. At the Cade, we call that mindset inventivity. 
We were excited to have Florida State of Innovation exhibit on display at Florida House, and we are thrilled to partner with the Florida House and the Inventors Hall of Fame on the speaker series. As I did last week, I now invite each of you to think of a favorite inventor of yours. Now think of their invention and its impact on society. In that context, you might imagine that inventors are individuals who are dreamers of big dreams, people who are problem solvers. At the Cade Museum, we believe each of us has an inherent ability to invent, to develop new answers and create innovative solutions to today's problems. To do so, we must tap into our own inventive mindset. All inventors and their inventions have the potential to change the world. The Cade Museum's namesake, Dr. James Robert Cade, was a professor and physician who was also the lead inventor of Gatorade. His invention story serves as our inspiration to deliver children and adults unprecedented access to world-class inventors and visionaries through exhibits and programming, like that which we are doing today. A guest to the Cade will never have the same exact same experience twice as the activities and themes rotate on a regular basis. We have hands-on learning labs where you might learn how to extract DNA from a strawberry. There's also a fab lab where you can learn about 3D printers and laser cutters or step into a virtual world wearing a VR headset. In everything you do at the Cade, we have experienced educators available to guide and encourage you to discover and invent. Not only do we have the museum, but you can also engage with the Cade through our Cade Prize for Innovation, as well as by listening to our Radio Cade podcast. The Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention is an important component of the state of Florida's innovation ecosystem. In 2010, when the Cade was founded, we were one of the very first institutions celebrating innovation and the inventive spirit in Florida. Our role has evolved, and while we still celebrate invention through our Cade Prize for Innovation, we are also meant to spark that inspires today's youngsters to become the inventors and entrepreneurs and visionaries of tomorrow. Come visit us the next time you're near Gainesville and discover the inventor in you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Now to begin the conversation, I would like to introduce our moderator, James Virgilio. James is one of the country's leading fiduciary investors and financial planners, as well as the co-founder of Chacon Diaz and De Virgilio Wealth Management. James has been featured on the world's largest news networks, was a Gator 100 honoree, and a 40 Gators Under 40 award winner. James is also an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, the co-host of the Gator National Football Podcast, and the co-host of the Radio Cade. Uh, thanks for having me. Let's jump right in. Uh, Phoebe, let's start talking about the museum itself, the Cade Museum in Gainesville, Florida. Give us a brief history of Gatorade and their role in starting this museum, along with your ideas to begin this project. Right, so the um, museum, the Cade Museum, is named after my father, who was the lead inventor of the team that invented Gatorade in 1965 at the University of Florida. So the origins of the museum are that, you know, growing up with a, an inventor as a father was a pretty awesome experience. I took it for granted. I thought everybody grew up with a crazy inventor for dad that was constantly bringing things home that were exciting and um, introducing me to a love for science and problem solving. And as I uh, grew older and we uh, moved away from town, we moved away from Florida, we were shocked when we started coming back to see this rising tide of innovation. Um, and I just wanted uh, to help give access to other people to have the same experiences I had as a child, growing up with an inventor, a literal seat at the table of an inventor. So that's kind of the, what we try to offer at the Cade Museum. As Stephanie said, our, our mission is to transform communities by inspiring and equipping future inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries. What is it like growing up with an inventor? Is every day something unique where your dad's coming home with new projects, new things to tinker on? Is he involving you in these things? I mean, what is that like? In my memory, that's how it was. I'm sure it wasn't, but in my memory, it's every day something exciting would happen. He would bring home um, even things like experimental lab dogs, which you weren't supposed to do back then, but he did. They became our family pets. He would bring home telescopes, antique music boxes. He did include the neighborhood children in many of his experiments because um, he 
he would be doing um, studies on, on physiology and running among children. So he created a track club called Plumbus Pettis Track Team, lead foot track team. And he enticed us all to run 100 miles in like a month um, and did studies on our cardiovascular system. So yes, we were definitely, all the kids in the neighborhood liked to hang out at our house because there, there was always something fun to try out. So why create the Cade Museum? Obviously, at that point in time in your life, you had plenty of other things going on. Why take this project on in the first place? Well, like I said, um, how we, where we ended up is really wanting to give people access to that because I, I believe that creativity and invention really are the future of the success of our nation and of our state, of any community, indeed. And when you look at... Um, so much of how our mindset, do we have an inventive mindset that is going to predict our success in the future? Do our kids raise with this inventive mindset? And the older I got and the more countries we moved to, my husband, Richard, was a foreign service officer. We lived in many overseas countries. Um, I became convinced that what, what separates the United States is not creative people, it's a creative ecosystem that allows creativity to flourish and allows invention and innovation to flourish. So is how do we create an institution that captures that and encourages that among the rising generation? Now the question I get asked the most is, is the Cade Museum just a museum? When I go there, what am I going to experience? Can you just spend a second kind of telling us what exactly the Cade Museum is? Is it something where I see an artifact or is it more involved in that? Right. Um, that's a great question. And we have gone around and around. Do we call it a museum or not? I like to point out to people that the word museum, what is the hidden word in museum? The first four letters is muse. So muse for creativity, so it should be something that sparks tech creativity and invention, but a museum tells to everybody it's open to the public, but the typical understanding of museum is dusty artifacts. We are not that. We are really think of ourselves as being an R&D lab for creativity, with creativity labs, innovation labs, hands-on experiences, the exhibits, are actually living exhibits in many cases. There are people that have invented, they're entrepreneurs, that then can inspire the visitors with their ideas. And that's very much back to my childhood experience of having a seat at the table with an inventor and talking about ideas. That's what I pictured is like, James, you could come in and you're gonna meet somebody that's super cool, that you can have a conversation with, and then you can use your hands to do some experiments, to learn more about um, a particular invention and how it works. Which is a great experience. Anyone who's attended anything uh, at the Cade, it is very hands-on, very interactive, and definitely not a place for dusty artifacts. Now, at the Florida House, where you are right now, uh, there is another exhibit called In a State of Innovation. Of course, we've already mentioned that multiple times on this call today. Uh, why do this particular exhibit? Right. In a state of innovation is really about uh, the state of Florida and how unexpectedly, I mean, many people don't realize that the state of Florida is one of the most innovative states in the nation. We still have a reputation of being um, mostly just a tourist destination, agriculture. Maybe people go to Disney World or they, they watch a rocket take off. But it is so much more and it's becoming a state of a, a, a leading state in innovation. It's just a story that's not told. So we felt we really wanted to capture that story, at least start telling that story of innovation. Because in my view, museums tell stories, They're storytellers, and they tell stories about things that are important to a place. So for instance, Maryland might have a museum on boating and ship making. Um, Oklahoma has a museum on the cowboy, but Florida needs a museum that tells the story of innovation. And that's... Okay, got it. Great, we're back. All right, All right. we're back. 
There we go. So uh, what I was asking you and what I'm going to ask you now is I, I have frequently parroted a lot of the, the sayings and the facts and the figures you've given out on the state of Florida. And I will typically start by saying Florida is already one of the top states for innovation, to which a friend will reply, come on, no way. I think of California. I think of Austin. I think of the Research Triangle. I think of the Northeast. I haven't heard people talk about Florida being a state of innovation. Can you give us some facts and figures just about how innovative the state of Florida is at the moment? Well, I, I would actually like to start with why do people not think of it as a state of innovation? And it's really because although we have the city that's the oldest continually occupied city in the United States at St. Augustine, we are a relatively young state as far as population is concerned. We were not in the first 13 colonies. We did not join until kind of mid, um, mid history. And our population didn't take off until the 1950s with the advent of air conditioning. So the only people that um, wrote about Florida, that talked about Florida um, in the rest of the nation were people that were vacationing there through the railroads, they would come on flagless railroads. So it became known as like the state of vacation, then the state of retiring and the state of agriculture. It's really because of that, that people nationwide don't really, it's hard for them to wrap their mind around this new evolution in the state's history. So I'd like to point out at this in the state of innovation that there were three major historical things that happened in the 50s that planted the seeds for today's innovation economy. But again, it's very recent. If you compare us to Ohio or New York that had a um, manufacturing infrastructure that goes way back into the 1800s, we did not have that until the three things happened. And that was the selection of um, Cape Canaveral for NASA and for rockets, um, Walt Disney World saying that they were going to locate in Central Florida, and finally the first medical school in the state of Florida. Imagine not having a medical school until the late 50s. And that is exactly what Florida was. So those three developments, people don't think are necessarily connected to the innovation economy, but they are. Um, we have more. Um, experts in LIDAR technology, more man hours than any other state in the nation. And LIDAR was what was used to map um, in, in, in lunar exploration and with uh, mapping distances and so forth. So it's also the technology behind driverless cars. So Florida is to driverless cars what the silicon chip is to Silicon Valley what the computers are to Silicon Valley. So this is huge growth in, um, in driverless cars and that type of technology, sensor technology. And then also we're the, the lead in gaming technology and animations nationwide, um, worldwide. And that goes back to all of the talent that poured into the state because of the theme parks. So it's much more than just tourism. It's the technology behind it and the innovation. And then finally, the medical Gatorade was um, a product of the brand new medical school. My father was recruited to teach the first graduating class of kidney doctors, had just graduated from the first public medical school. They were studying to be kidney doctors. So Gatorade became a kidney research project. It was a kidney research project that became a world famous beverage. And that the sale of Gatorade and the royalties associated with it have led to seed funding for medical research that have turned Florida into this um, a hotbed for medical innovations. And it's not just Gainesville, it's throughout the state, that innovation quarter, the five top research universities, because they knew early on how important leveraging academic patents and ideas would be for creating future economies. So those three seeds are like, incredible stories, but it just, it takes a while for a seed to grow into a tree and to bear fruit. So 1950 is really, it's not that long ago. State no, no, it's definitely not. And one of the things I've really enjoyed uh, learning about are the inventors themselves. So for, for example, I mean, I grew up hearing about Gatorade. I drank Gatorade. You want to be an athlete, you know about Gatorade, but you wouldn't often hear about your dad, Dr. Kate. And then you hear all these stories and it really brings uh, to color you know, it brings it down to our level of oh, this was a person who was who was trying to solve problems in their community. And that's so much of what the Kate is trying to do today. Look at who's trying to solve problems today, who's trying to push our society forward. Uh, tell us about some initiatives at 
the cave going on right now that are there to celebrate and encourage uh, innovation across the state. Well, the, um, one of the main ones that we're pushing now um, is actually we're going into our 12th year is the Cade Prize for, in, um, for Innovation. We started out as a Florida prize, but now it's expanded into the Southeast. And that's really to find the next Gatorade. What is the next research project that is going to turn into a product that is going to get out into the market and change the way we live and to improve the, improve the way we live? So the Cade Prize um, is open now. Um, for applications. We'll be selecting the $50,000 um, prize winners um, at the end of September. That's at the Cade Museum. And our really great insight was that is the source for having new inventors and ideas all the time at the Cade Museum. People ask, how do you meet all these inventors? I said, well, my husband came up with it, Richard. He's my, the co um, uh, the co-founder with me with the Cade Museum. He really it was his brainchild back in 2010. And it's grown every year and it is a constant source of amazing ideas and inventors. We make each inventor sign when they apply that if they apply for the prize, they would be willing to come teach a class at the museum. So we have a constant inflow of ideas and people and innovations, which is exciting for, for our community to have access to them. So that's one, the Cade Prize, and we tie it back into our education. We also have a, a full complement of, um, it's a proprietary educational approach, a framework for innovation that we call the building blocks of invention. And that it's a framework of taking an idea from a creation with a creative idea all the way to market. And it goes through many different phases and cycles, but we have a matched curriculum and uh, experiences to each one of those parts of the framework, down from the foundation of creativity through the pillars of science that we call um, like the core knowledge that you need, but more importantly, how do you put the knowledge together in an inventive way? And how do you partner with industry to get these invention products out into the community? And that would be the top part of the framework. Um, so everything is through the lens of that framework. Everything is through the lens of invention. Because as you mentioned, every invention has a story and people love stories. They learn through stories more than just saying, James, this is what electromagnetism is, memorize it in a book. If you see the story of an inventor that used the concept to create Bluetooth, that's a very different thing, much more accessible. Yeah, much more accessible, much more relatable, much more uh, encouraging at this point in time. If you'd like to ask a question, maybe just go ahead and pop that into the chat and I will read that to her. I'll start us off by asking my own question. I've heard you talk a lot about the state of Florida and really America in general being a nation of ideas and the importance of it being a nation of ideas. Can you just describe a little bit further in detail what that means? A nation of ideas is. Um... It is what we are. We are bound together by an idea. And our nation itself was an innovation. And the primary mover of that innovation was ideas. There, um, it's captured in our US Constitution with the right to invent. That was one of the major ideas that we focus on at the Cade Museum. It's Article 1, um, Section 8, the so called Inventors Clause that inventors and authors have the right to the respective inventions and ideas for a limited time. And the limited time is the patent system that then opens up the idea to everybody, which brings down, um, which provides availability and economy and job. And our founding fathers were actually brilliant. They knew this was gonna be the secret of our success as a nation because we had no industry. We we're completely dependent on England and Europe for imports. And they thought we need to give an incentive to capture the ideas of ordinary people, not just um, the ones with access, with high level degrees and with wealthy families, but to the ordinary American. It was a democratic process of innovation. I'd like to point out it was the most, the, the patent system was one of the most innovative systems. I mean, the most uh, open, most democratic of all institutions in America, even women before they had the right to vote had the right to invent, and they did. Um, people of all backgrounds, including Black Americans that were free, 
were allowed to invent and patent and profit from their inventions. So when you look at the number of inventions in America, it's it's an incredible, now I've lost count of where we are now in the national patent system, but that, that system doesn't exist in most countries. It's not that creative people don't exist. Creative people are everywhere. They don't have access to the innovation ecosystem that we have here. And Florida is just one example of a state that has really developed that ecosystem with um, top down and bottom up in all ways to provide that opportunity to everybody in the state. Yeah, I love talking about that. It is such a, a driver to recognize that just allowing a system to foster ideas and ownership of ideas can, can create a tremendous amount of flourishing. All right, our first question uh, comes from Emma. Where do you see the future of the Cade Museum in the next five years? Oh, well, I could go on forever for that. We just had our strategic retreat last week. Um, I believe that in, inventivity is the, the name we've coined for this concept of um, creativity intersecting with technology and problem solving. So inventivity is um, really at the core of what it is to be human, I believe. And when people have access to that and see themselves as being filled with inventivity, it changes their mindset. And our, our goal in the next five years is to develop and refine this curriculum, this inventivity mindset and share it with the world. We have, um, we have the technology to do that now of sharing our, the, the modules, the curriculum, the way of thinking, the access to inventors, and we can share it with any community across the world, both physically and virtually. And so we, we see ourselves as being an R&D lab for inventivity education. And once a, a product is developed and refined, we then share that with the world. So they come to the Florida house and see this new in a state of innovation. That's one example. It's an R&D exhibit. It's our first go at trying to capture the story. Even just this morning, I was going through the executive director saying, wow, we could change this. We should alter this. We can, the next one is going to be even better. And at that point, we put it out on the road with our proprietary interactive exhibits and share that with people in the hopes that all communities can grow into their full potential. How can area schools and teachers get involved in the future work of the community? Right, so we already have extensive um, partnerships with the Alachua County School System, which is the county that, where the museum is. And we were um, worked very closely through COVID to get science content into the schools and into the homes. So we already have, we do teacher training. They come to the museum now, we go to them. We have online um, PBS backpacks and PBS spots that um, focus on science education. Um, in the future, that is our strategy in the next five years to develop what we're developing in Alachua County for a much wider um, school-based audience. And it's really, if you think about our curriculum, is it's not just knowledge. A knowledge economy is very important but in the future, most of the jobs aren't even going to be things that we can predict right now. You can't train kids in a specific job that we don't even know what's gonna be in 15 years. We can train them in the inventive mindset, the mindset to be inspired by solving problems. So that's, um, we work with school system, with really any organization we work with to have them come and try to incorporate that mindset into their own institutions. So we, we like to like send this DNA, this creativity DNA out to other organizations and have them incorporate that into their own institutions. We do not want to um, replace or compete with any other nonprofit. We want to help them do their mission better. Phoebe, what recommendations do you have for young people to get involved with innovation? Get involved with the Cade Museum? With innovation in general. Oh, with innovation. Um, have a lot more free time and not be so driven by exams. I mean, exams are important, don't get me wrong. You do have to measure whether 
kids are learning, but I think the emphasis on um, tests where there is one right answer, it's an important factor, but it's just one half of the factor of being an inventor. An inventor has to have knowledge, but they have to have free time to look at a problem and say, this isn't matching the knowledge I have. And they have to have the mindset to think, how would I, how could I apply this from field A to this to field B and combine it together? Almost every inventor will tell you they came up with their idea when they're relaxed, on vacation, in the shower, taking a walk. I come up with all my best ideas when I'm asleep. No kidding. I'll wake up with the idea. And it's, you cannot invent when you're hyper-focused. And our society is way too hyper-focused and they're too distracted with busyness to be able to be a true inventor. So I would say play with the Lincoln Logs, play with the Legos, go for a walk, build a fort outside. All of those childhood experiences are very invaluable in addition to learning specific knowledge. Now this next question I've come across a lot as a co-host of Radio Kate interviewing all sorts of innovators, inventors, entrepreneurs, and the question essentially is, how does someone from a background that's not STEM related get involved with innovation? And I'll, I'll jump ahead to the cliff notes there and say, a lot of the inventors I have spoken to do not have a STEM background, even if they wind up being in what you think would be a STEM field. Right, well, um, that's a great question. And that's why we call our museum a STEAM museum, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I also like to add in music with the mathematics because music is math that you can hear. Um, so STEAM is definitely a full brain process. And it's not just, I, I like to give the analogy of inside an individual brain, you have a creativity comes from the full brain being engaged. It's not the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere. That's a false narrative, a false story, but it's truly when they see creative ideas coming through with fMRI imaging, it's a full brain solution. In the same way, inventions are rarely a solitary endeavor. I can't really think of any, even Gatorade was not a solitary endeavor. It was a friendship between two people, a football coach who was not a doctor and a kidney doctor in a conversation about why are football players not peeing during a game. And boom, this whole idea arose. So no invention arises in a vacuum and no successful invention arises just with scientists. In fact, that I've never seen that happen. The inventor scientist is not the same as the entrepreneur. They're both creative, but they come at the, um, their creativity is applied in different ways and they're all essential. Artists and design, marketing, all of those parts make a successful invention. So there is space for all academic types and all thinkers in bringing a creative idea to an invention, to a product, to the market. Now, Suzanne asks, what years uh, were or was the Gator football team testing out your dad's product? 1965, in a day when there was no such thing as sports drinks, they practiced water deprivation. Water was withheld because that was, they thought it would cause cramping. And they also, also thought that it was for sissies. That was what they said back then, um, that you wouldn't drink water because you wanted to prove you were tough. So along comes a kidney doctor saying, I have an idea. And the, the football player, I mean, the coach said, well, I'm all for helping the Gators, but you can't touch the varsity. But the freshman team, yeah, that's fine. You can work with the freshman team. So that was 1965 freshman team that were, did not actually play that year. I think it's changed now. And James, you would know more than me when that changed. But in 1965, freshmen recruited, they did not play any varsity games. And there were some notable players on that freshman team, right? Not the freshman team, but there was a very notable player <laughs> on who was a junior that year and his senior year won the first Heisman Trophy. That would be the famous Steve Spurrier. Um, and he won the Heisman Trophy. So thanks to the freshmen who were the guinea pigs during the first year of this, of this testing, they said, hey, this is actually working. And then uh, Steve Spurrier was able to benefit from Gatorade the following year. 
Well, so I had a conversation with one. I'm, I'm certain I'm that he was a fabulous quarterback. Um, but I'm also certain that he was hydrated and no one else was in the nation. So I think it's both. Um, I have a, a photo I would like to share with you of the original Gatorade team. This is C Steve Spurrier drinking the first Gatorade out of a milk carton. This is a replica of the dairy science at University of Florida. Um, the, the director was friends with my father. And if you can read this, it says, can you read it? Yeah. What yeah. does it say? Agricultural Experiment Station, Gainesville, Florida. Yeah, dairy right. science. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad was friends with um, the director of there and, and just they started bottling it. And that's why you see Steve drinking milk and all of the first um, fans were like, why are the Gators drinking milk? That's the craziest thing ever. But then they went, they started winning all their games. They, they, some people said the Gators were the worst undefeated team in the history of the nation. It's hard, it's hard to put that into like modern terms today. Imagine going to watch your favorite sporting team and they're drinking something out of uh, something that would be surprising to you, right? Like a milk carton on the sideline during the game. And then they start winning. And then you hear this rumor, there's some sports drink. What is that? You know, uh, it's really a fascinating story, especially because as you mentioned, people were not even drinking water back right. then. Uh, and then now all of a sudden they're able to, you know, in Florida, the heat, and the humidity, they're able to replace everything that was via sweat. Of course, Gatorade is born. So remarkable. Uh, stuff. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have in the chat for now. So I'd like to offer you, Phoebe, any closing comments that you'd like to end our session with. Oh, I'm trying to think of anything we didn't cover. Um, well, come up to the Florida House if you haven't been. Um, my husband and I live here in Washington. Um, we're here because my husband is a retired Foreign Service officer. And um, our kids are all up here, but we are in Florida all the time. We split our time between the two places. If any of you are up here, we'd love to give you a personal tour of the exhibit here. Um, it's pretty interesting. And get your feedback so we can improve it for the next iteration, since you remember this is where the R&D lab. I love it. Uh, Phoebe Miles, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the creator and co-founder of the Cade Museum. And at this point in time, I'll turn it back over to our program hosts. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Phoebe Miles for participating today. And thank you so much to James DiVirgilio for being our moderator. Phoebe, the story about the Cade Museum is so insightful and inspiring. And it's really great to hear how Florida invention and innovation really founded its roots in the story of Gatorade. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who was able to join us today. We will be hosting the Meet an Inventor series every Tuesday at noon, so make sure to invite your friends. We are excited to see you all next week for our speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Quinn, who is an environmental engineer from NASA's Surface Systems Office at the Kennedy Space Center. Thank you again to James Virgilio and Phoebe Miles, and we hope you had a great time here at Florida House on Capitol Hill, where you're always welcome. Thank you. I don't want to touch anything. <laughs>